Hey guys, this is Josh with the Depth Tape Channel, and in this video, we are going to be doing Diesel 101 cooling system principles. So, in this video, we're going to be talking about the cooling system and the cooling system only. And if you're wondering if the cooling system needs its own little class, yes, it does. It's very important, and it really helps keep your engine from breaking down. Now, this is the only system we're going to be discussing that's actually optional when it comes to an engine. And what do I mean by that? Well, the engine obviously needs a fuel system or it won't have power to produce any energy. It needs an oil system or else it will only function for a few seconds before seizing. It obviously needs a system to get air in and out of the engine and it needs a crankshaft and an engine block. But the cooling system is optional. There are many engines that have been and are still produced today that have no liquid cooling system. Plenty of lawnmowers, weed whackers, and motorcycles out there that don't have this system. Not only that, there have been many car engines produced over the years that don't have it either. The most ubiquitous one, of course, would be the Volkswagen Beetle, which used an air-cooled engine. Did not have a normal liquid cooling system. Now, the oil system does help cool the engine, and air-cooled engines generally rely on the oil to help regulate the temperature a little bit. So you may ask yourself, okay, well, if it's optional, why does pretty much every vehicle have one? And the answer to that question is that if Peterbilt engineers tomorrow decided, hey, you know, we're gonna build a truck, but we don't wanna deal with a radiator or any of the other components that tend to leak and cause maintenance, so we're gonna build an air-cooled diesel engine. And instead of the normal 500 horsepower 15 diesel uh, liter diesel engine that they put in their truck, this engine would not produce that much power. It would probably produce less than 100 horsepower instead of the normal 500. And the reason for that is it needs a way to get heat energy out of an engine that's producing a lot of power. The main chunk of this video is going to be a thought experiment in order to show how the individual components of the cooling system function and why they're designed the way they are. So let's theorize that you are Rudolph Diesel and you now have a fully functional single cylinder basically ambient air cooled engine. And you notice that after it runs for a little while, it gets up to about 200 degrees and it runs very well. There's very little cylinder wear as far as glazing caused by too cold of a cylinder. It runs very efficiently. And with that, it has reduced exhaust emissions. But you notice that if it gets much higher than that, let's say 230 degrees, that it damages the engine. It'll crack the cylinder head, it'll blow the head gasket out. It'll cause seizure between the piston and the cylinder walls. Now, you don't want this, you don't want it to overheat, but you also don't want it to run much lower than 200 degrees because then it has the issues we just discussed. It has increased diesel consumption because it's running inefficiently. It has increased wear and increased emissions. So you say to yourself, okay, well, I can't just let it run. It'll overheat. So what if I were to make the cylinder block and the cylinder head bigger and drill passages in them and then pour a ubiquitous liquid like water into these passages and then seal them off somehow? You fire it up and you notice that it does climb in temperature, but it climbs at a much slower pace than it was before because you've increased the mass that is getting heated up. However, after a few minutes after it normally would have over overheated, it still overheats. So you say to yourself, okay, well, I guess I, get, I just cannot keep exponentially increasing the size of this engine to try and reduce the engine from overheating. I need a way to try to pull some heat energy out of the engine. So you think of a fan, like a ceiling fan, and this is the first moving component we're gonna be discussing is the fan. Now there's not a lot to discuss on a fan. Everyone has seen one and they move air. And that's pretty much all they do. So you bolt this fan to the front of your engine and you run a belt off the crankshaft and you fire it up and it cools the engine. It's not overheating. However, it is not getting warm enough either. It's only running at about 150 degrees no matter how long you run it, it's overcooling. So you say to yourself, well, maybe there's a way I can put some sort of device on the fan where I can switch it on and off when I want. And this would be called a fan clutch. And pretty much all engine driven fans have these to control when the fan is kicked on and kicked off. Remember the fan is not free energy either. It is pulling horsepower out of the engine, which increases the fuel consumption. And if it ran all the time, it would overcool the engine. So. 
You run the engine now, you can switch the fan on and off when you want, and you keep it in that sweet spot of around 200 degrees. You now have a stationary engine not doing any work, but it's not overheating, and it's not running too cold. So you decide to put this in a early vehicle and see how it operates. So you put it in the vehicle, make sure everything's okay, you put it in gear, and you start going down the road. You notice that the temperature's climbing, so you turn the fan on, but the temperature continues to climb. You notice whenever the vehicle's stationary, it's fine, but when it's moving, meaning it's doing something with the engine, which requires an increase in horsepower from the engine, that it's not able to reduce the temperature of the engine enough. So you think to yourself, well, maybe because it's just a big engine block, you need a better heat exchanger. So you basically build a box, a big square, and have copper cores running and tanks on the end, and you run two hoses, an inlet and an outlet, from the engine, and you fill that with water too. So now the engine, the hoses, and this thing we'll call a, a radiator, we'll just call it a radiator, now has doubled the capacity of the cooling system, and the hotter coolant in the engine is, through conduction, going to push some heat energy into the radiator. So you put it in gear again, and you go down the road, and guess what? It doesn't overheat. Okay, I think we got some here. I think we're done. Nothing else I can think of. So then you're like, well, you know, I'm just driving this vehicle around this testing grounds at 10 miles an hour. It's not really doing much. Let's hook a trailer to it. Let's hook a cattle trailer to it. So you hook your cattle trailer to it, and you start driving around at 10 miles an hour, and you notice now it's climbing in temperature again, and it's overheating. Is there no end to this experiment? So... There's got to be a way to force the hotter coolant out or water out of the engine into the radiator faster than just straight conduction. So you devise some sort of pump that pumps water, a water pump, and it forces colder coolant from the radiator into the engine, which forces the hotter water out of the engine into the radiator and just cycles. You now have a closed loop cooling system and you put your cattle trailer on the back again, and guess what? You're driving along, and it works great. It does not get hot at all. In fact, it's, once again, running at 150 degrees, and it won't climb over that. You're like, oh, man, you know, I'm, I'm close here. I'm close. I know I'm close because it's not overheating. That's great. It's capable of cooling even with the engine under a load, but I need a way for it not to overcool either. There's got to be a way, some sort of valve or something, that could shut off the coolant when it's warming up but then open when it's too hot so you're staring at your candles on your desk and you're thinking you know what wax maybe wax is the answer what if i made some sort of valve that had wax inside that melts around we'll say 210 degrees that would open a valve that would then allow the hot coolant out of the engine, water out of the engine, into the radiator, back into the engine, and then if it gets too cold, we'll say 200 degrees, it solidifies again and closes. I think I'll call it a thermostat. Yeah, because it, it regulates the thermal energy. Yeah, I'll call it a thermostat. And you put that on the outlet of the engine, and guess what? Now you have a controlled cooling system. Basically, all the components you need to get your cooling system to function. Now, of course, if any one of these components fails, even the hoses between the radiator and the engine, it's not going to work right. So you need them all working in conjunction to keep you in that magic spot of about 200 degrees. Now, after all these experiments, you notice a couple things, though, by using just water. The first one is the engine and the cylinder head are made of iron. Iron and water don't like each other very much. They tend to form rust, which, of course, is very bad for the iron. So you don't want your engine rusting out. Not only that, water has a couple other bad properties to it. Water freezes, of course, and if it's too cold, it can freeze and damage the engine. Also, water boils at around 212 degrees at sea level. Fahrenheit, that is. And if water boils, that creates its own set of issues. One, you then have air pockets forming in the engine from the boiling water. Air pockets can cause something called cavitation which when you first hear it doesn't even sound real the small air bubbles from the boiling water can actually damage the steel and iron in the engine and cause fairly heavy damage 
So those are some bad properties because you're running close to that 212 degrees all the time, and that's only at sea level. As you increase in elevation, the ambient air pressure decreases significantly. Around 6,000 feet, it doesn't boil at 212 degrees. It boils around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is way lower than the 210 degrees that the thermostat's open. So you don't want to use something other than water because it's so... It's everywhere and it's basically free and it's an excellent, excellent heat conductor. Water, which is a liquid, conducts heat energy roughly 25 times greater than air does. So you don't want to just try and make an air-cooled engine again. You want to stick with a liquid-cooled engine design. But water has those issues with the boiling and the rust and the cavitation. So you devise a additive, basically, that you'll mix in a 50-50 ratio with water and you'll call it coolant or antifreeze. So it has a couple properties to it, and they're all very important. First one is it prevents rust, heavily prevents rust. In fact, at a 50-50 ratio, there's pretty much zero rust in this engine. Now, the coolant will break down over time, and you'll need to flush it out, but it'll keep it from rusting. The other thing is it lowers the freezing point of the water significantly, so you won't have the water freezing in your engine and potentially cracking the engine block or the cylinders, anything like that. Also, you could add some anti-cavitation inhibitors, but one of the best things about antifreeze is it raises the boiling point. Antifreeze is either ethylene glycol or propylene glycol based, and it boils at a higher temperature. So by mixing it with water, you are raising the boiling point, which is a good thing. So now, instead of it boiling at 212 degrees, Perhaps now it boils at 220 degrees. So we're good so far. So you've now raised the boiling punt, taken care of the cavitation issues to some extent, and reduced the rust and freezing issues that just straight water have. But 220 degrees at sea level, once you start getting at elevation, or if the engine were to start overheating good up close to that magic number, it's going to boil over anyway, even with the antifreeze in there. So you need a way to increase the boiling point past just what the straight ambient air pressure can give you. Now, of course, not all engines are operated at sea level either. Most are not because obviously most people live on the land and not in the ocean. So you want to be able to increase and keep constant pressure in that cooling system. And you can't control the ambient air pressure. So what if you just sealed off the cooling system? You just put a lid on it. Well, that would increase the pressure in the system because as heat energy is being forced into the cooling system, then it's going to increase in pressure as anything that's heated, especially a liquid that can boil, will increase in pressure. The problem with this, though, is you're not controlling the pressure. And remember, you have somewhat sensitive elements in the cooling system. The radiator, for example, has seals in it. It has very thin either aluminum or copper coal tubes that run through it. You also have rubber hoses that can leak or burst if they're given too much pressure. So instead of just a lid, what if you put, like the thermostat where you could regulate it, what if you put a pressure regulated cap on this system that would hold 10 PSI or 20 PSI? Every PSI pressure point increase increases the boiling temperature of your coolant, roughly 2 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you now are at 212 degrees at sea level boiling point for your antifreeze mixture, then you raise the pressure of the system artificially with a, a radiator cap that's regulated by, for pressure by 10 PSI, you'll now be over 230 degree boiling point. You now basically have the entire cooling system that every vehicle is operating with today. Now, just because we've talked about all the components does not mean we're done with the cooling system discussion because there's a few other things to understand about how the cooling system works and some maintenance items on it. The first one is the radiator cap, which we just discussed, and this is more of a safety issue. You should not, and you probably already know this or have heard this, ever remove the radiator cap off of a hot engine. And the reason for this is somewhat obvious since the discussion we just had, it raises the boiling point in temperature. If you have a very hot engine that's under pressure because of the cap, but you remove the cap, what happens? You just lowered 
the point at which the coolant will boil, which means it can instantly boil now, and which of course can cause it to shoot out of the radiator, which you were just standing by when you remove the cap. It can burn you very badly, and it can also spill extremely hot coolant all over the place, and of course then you're losing your coolant also. All bad things, so don't remove radiator caps off of hot engines, especially just to check the level. Always check the level when it's cold. So that's first thing. Other thing is you have to understand that the ambient air temperature matters on the cooling system because the radiator is a heat exchanger, meaning you need a differential between the ambient air temperature and the cooling system, the coolant, to get heat energy out of the coolant. As you increase the ambient air temperature, the differential decreases, which means you get less and less heat exchanging properties. So that's why you generally overheat when it's hot outside. It's not a problem with the cooling system necessarily. It's that there's less heat exchanging going on because there's a lesser heat differential between the ambient air and the coolant. Whenever someone starts talking about an engine overheating, they always generally either tell me that they replaced the thermostats first thing off and that didn't fix it, or should they replace the thermostats? And my answer is usually no, you should not. If thermostats are causing an overheat, generally this is the scenario. Your engine starts and within a few minutes of it running, it just climbs in temperature to which the point it starts to overheat, never dropping temperature. The other problem usually is the coolant will never reach temperature, meaning the thermostat is stuck open and not regulating the temperature in that regard. Now, if your complaint is that going up a hill in 110 degree weather is causing an overheat, it's not the thermostats. Theoretically, the thermostat could not be, we'll say it's only partially opening and not allowing enough coolant flow. I have never, I have not once ever fixed an overheat with such a complaint with a thermostat swap. I've done many as customer requested, but it almost always ends up being either the cooling system has not been maintained, the water pump is not pumping fluid, or the most common one is the radiator itself. You have to remember that the radiator is the only thing exchanging heat in this situation. It can plug externally and internally and cause cooling system efficiency reduction. Also, over time, especially if the cooling system is not maintained, they can become plugged internally, generally starting from the bottom and then working their way to the top, the tubes can, restricting or completely blocking off the tubes themselves, which of course, you're basically getting a smaller and smaller radiator at that point, reducing your efficiency. Generally, I tell people if they're overheating, they need to look at their radiator first and then everything else second. That's generally the first cause, especially on RVs. RVs tend to run their cooling system, at least the radiator and the charge air cooler, which is generally in front of the radiator, much closer to the ground. This enables a lot more debris to get trapped between the charge air cooler and the radiator. And generally they sit a lot more and get less maintenance done to the cooling system, which can increase corrosion buildup and other problems internal to the radiator. Now there's not really much else to talk about the cooling system. It's a fairly simple system once you understand how it all operates, but it's a good idea to have a good understanding of how all the systems work together before you just go out and let's say replace the thermostats because your engine's overheating on a hill climb. So I hope you enjoy this video. I try to make it as informative as possible. Thanks for watching.